Well, never mind that. Uh, <clears throat> this is Breckenridge Elkins on Stumble and Radio. What I say on this show is not popular, and I do not want it to be. I can't see the chat room, by the way, unfortunately, this evening. So if you have any comments, uh, go ahead and call in. And uh, basically, as I say, I'm not interested in the opinions of others I'm, because I'm not a peddler selling my ideology. I'm not a ideological mountebank, as one might say. My purpose in doing this show is not to tailor a message or to proclaim a doctrine in so much as to make others aware of the gulf emerging between the superhuman, the human, and the subhuman, which is developing as we speak. Now, if you don't understand that, that's too bad. I'm not going to help you understand if you misunderstand and criticize me due to the misunderstanding that's just the way it's going to go you know i can't help that uh i'm certainly not going to bitch about you uh basing certain assertions upon my of my regarding my character on this fraudulent view you may hold but i'm not going to let it worry me like i said that's your problem and i'm not going to explain it any further as uh, I wrote, posted this recent article by Jonathan Bowden entitled, Why We Write. <clears throat> it says, Why is this done? Merely to provide a template whereby the battle occurs betwixt the superhuman and the subhuman, per se. And it exists across or between individuals. Now, what does this mean? Can you explain to me what this means? This is always difficult to, accept, to assess. I'm quoting again. But from the, this distance, three different spare points become discernible through the myth. This is what he's talking about, why he writes. Now, <clears throat> fundamentally, the problem as it presents itself, as I said previously, is, and as uh, basically Bowden uh, elucidates on the subject, is uh, quite simple. We have a pro- We have a problem in which action and intellect are completely separated from one another. I've said this a dozen times. I've said it more than a dozen times, probably. And uh, it's one of those things I will repeat because I don't have a problem repeating it, you know, in, in that uh, in that line. And uh, as I've said before, also, our weakness is their strength. Therefore, those who are physically weak are uh, therefore incapable of fighting back strength-wise, and those who are mentally weak are uh, incapable of fighting back uh, intellectually. So, and uh, all the problems we have today, <clears throat> as I said, uh, with the state are basically we have these problems and we have no solutions to them. And so I'm going to uh, to offer solutions tonight. And uh, as usual, I'm going to go into this figure of the cultured thug, which Bowden <clears throat> brings out in his uh, article, Why We Write. And uh, I believe it's in, available at the Occidental Quarterly. Now, the problem is, as I said, this cultured thug, because it doesn't exist. We have people before us right now uh, who are ca- who are very strong and very, uh, say, muscle heads, and we don't have much respect for them. Their intelligence, their ability, and you have these nerds, these four-eyed nerds, and who is who are basically uh, incapable of strength, or uh, if they work themselves up. Um, build themselves up uh, like Teddy Roosevelt did, they still present a rather less than fearsome appearance. So we ver- now, we do not have this figure that we once had, the cultured thug. This is the aristocrat, the learned killer, the philosopher who is also marches in battle, as Socrates did. We do not no longer see this figure as exi- in existence. And 
this is the fundamental problem with the movement in general. Now, as I've said, <clears throat> I'm going to deal with some figures who both who wielded both the sword and pen with equal proficiency. And uh, basically, you have the scholarly American aristocrats uh, who were once the most feared fighters on the face of this earth. Now, what I'm doing this series, which is going to be synonymous or rather in alongside the broadcast on the, the broadcasts on the Ku Klux Klan, and these broadcasts are going to deal with are going to be called the sword and pen broadcasts. And I'm going to deal with a series of individuals who are role models to us today. Uh, <clears throat> basically what Bowden writes was written before him by Windham Lewis first and then Yukio Mishima. And uh, what they said is art and intellect are both starved of action. Intellect is starved of action. Art is starved of action. We have disregarded the cultured man for the stereotypes of the strong but ignorant thug and the pencil-necked nerd, as I said. Now, both these stereotypes are uniquely American in that they are both devoid of moral and cultural refinement. And uh, this is what uh, basically... Uh, this uh, lack of morality and culture that we find in the modern American mind. I think it was Clemenceau the, who said, America is the only civilization to go from barbarism to decadence without having a period of high culture in between. And this is basically the way it's been uh, throughout the, uh, the epochs, of, th throughout the ages, every civilization has had a golden age. Now, we had a gilded age, much different. Uh, and as a result, uh, this, uh, Americans hate and fear the very idea of a gentleman of moral and culture, of, of good morals and high culture, who is also a scholar and a killer. This is the greatest Hollywood villain who... This is the one, this is the archetype of the Hollywood villain. Uh, every every uh, uh, smooth-talking, well-dressed, cold-blooded killer in Hollywood history has been like this. And on the opposite, um, we've come to believe, on the opposite, on the other hand, we've come to believe in the myth of the uh, poorly clad, scruffy American underdog. And we... This is done intentionally because the American aristocrats are completely and intentionally being forgotten and being erased from the pages of history. And this is done partly, or partially rather, to deprive Americans of role models of leadership. We don't need more businessmen or more lawyers or even more working men as leaders. We just need men, as Kodrano said. Uh, we just need real men in the movement. This would make all the difference, because if we had these men, these men would demand certain standards, and these stan they would see that these standards were lived up to. This is just the natural order of things. Um, some men will demand a level of accountability just by their very nature. Now, as I said, uh, this criteria is necessary of what is manliness, and I would add the stipulation to what Kodrano said, men who can wield both the sword and pen. Men who can wield both the sword and pen. This is all I can say. This is our foremost purpose. We have to recreate these role models and eliminate the original role model that exists before us. So now I'm going to go in and talk about uh, Texas. Now, Texas and Texan heroes. Texas was an archaeofuturist state in that it combined, to begin with, radical traditionalism and the bleeding edge of technology in the 1840s. And I'm going to go into this a bit, but I'm, we're going to see Texas tonight through the eyes of a man named John S. or John Salmon. Rip Ford. 
John Salmon uh, Rip Ford. His name was uh, his nickname was Rip, and we're going to go into that a little bit, as I said. <clears throat> John, uh, now he's completely forgotten uh, from the pages of of uh, history. He's been neglected time and time again because he represents this sort of gentlemanly. A uh, scholarly individual who was also a noted fighter and a noted killer in his day. He was a lawyer, he was a doctor, he was a politician. He came from one of the noblest families in the South. And he uh, started to, uh, he did very well in school early on as a teenager. And he decided to read law. So he got into uh, reading law. And, uh, I'm sorry, uh, actually, he did not start reading law first. He he wanted to become a doctor. Uh, s somehow my mind just got carried away with me. Uh, like I said, uh, basically, he decided to read law, and uh, I'm not talking about lords and nobles. I'm talking about aristocrats. We're not talking about lords and nobles. The difference between an aristocrat and a lord and noble is quite obvious. Uh, an aristocrat is, does not have a title. He is just a noble person. The very term noble in Anglo-Saxon denotes a superiority. He was a noble man. He was a superior man. Now, anyway, going into this, Rip Ford at 19 decided to study med medicine. Uh, these aristocrats will lead the killing. They will. The aristocrats do not exist currently. I, I've laid this case very clearly out, and what I find is that a lot of my listeners who've listened to many shows aren't really paying attention. I've said that these aristocrats will emerge from the bloodbath um, that will uh, that is inevitable um, in the future. And this is where we're going to get this new breed of individual. So anyway, getting back on topic, uh, John Salmon Ford uh, studied medicine. He didn't study it like a doctor does today. He apprenticed himself to a doctor, and he studied medicine at 19. He, uh, by the time he was 21, he was a practicing physician. He had a wife and two children, and... Uh, Unfortunately, their relationship did not work out, so they separated, and uh, Ford uh, decided to go to Texas. And this was a common uh, thing for young men to do at the time. He was uh, he was a uh, he, there was a war going on in Texas at the time, and he decided to go down there and make the best of it, as it were. So he headed down to Texas, and. Uh, in a horse and wagon, and arrived there after the hostilities ceased. And basically, he served there as a lawyer for quite a few years. And basically, uh, and was somewhat successful as a lawyer. He studied law, and um, he ran for state. And shortly after that, he ran for state office as a legislature, and uh, it, he uh, did quite well. And this was a time when Texas, as a state, was very open, and uh, there was an there was an element of uh, where these people were coming into Texas and they were being refined. And for a long time, as I said before, Texans were considered a unique breed, a unique kind of person. To be a Texan was almost to uh, uh, was almost a unique, a unique race or sub-ethnicity, uh, and uh, this is what's interesting because Texas was a region that it only attracted a certain type of person, and this certain type of person it filtered out other people, and as a result, this per these types of people flourished, and they developed into a sub-ethnicity. And so Texans were recognized not just merely by their accent or by their dress, that they became in themselves a minor sub-ethnicity. And to this day, I, you can tell a Texan 
uh, a native Texan, a genera- uh, Texan of se- several generations. And you can tell another thing about George Bush, he aped the mannerisms of a uh, long-term Texan, even though he wasn't. He probably had lessons be- in doing so, but actually he, or you will see a lot of people in such situations who will adopt, of course, the culture around them and become like that culture, but they're not part of the original culture. So, But in these early days, it was dangerous to live in Texas, obviously, but the rewards were so great, a young man... Could uh, could start off with literally nothing and uh, <clears throat> accumulate quite a lot of goods over a period of time, and uh, this is what was unique about Texas in the uh, in the uh, early period. And as I said, uh, Mandalore, the whole concept of the well-born, cultured, educated warrior is basically a myth from today, from our standards, from our viewpoint. It is a myth. It must be a myth. Uh, I, I saw a very simple, similar deal on Royce's blog today where this uh, uh, researcher who's written a book called Sex at Dawn uh, uh, argues, his name is Christopher Ryan, he argues that uh, at one uh, once upon a time, uh, fatherhood was not... Uh, considered to be uh, at all uh, popular among the early homo sapiens, uh, rather, (laughs) homo sapiens, (laughs) homo sapiens, and this whole concept of paternalism did not exist, he argues. Now, um, he is is an adherent of polyamory, and uh, basically, in a different time, everybody would laugh at him. Now he's a respected thinker. And my point in bringing this case up is the idea that I'm bringing forth that the um, the norm is an aristocratic warrior of good blood and breeding, like this Rip Ford, which I'm bringing out, is he a myth? Did he not exist? Well, he doesn't exist. You've never heard of him before. So uh, basic, basically, the man, Rip Ford, must be a myth. He can't have existed since he has disappeared from the pages of history. They're not, they don't make movies about Rip Ford. He killed too many Mexicans. Uh, he was served in the Confederate Army. He was so a gentleman uh, warrior such as Rip Ford could not have existed. It seems impossible. And uh, see, once again, Mandalore is uh, in the chat arguing that the children of plastic surgeons and Wall Street executives. These are not aristocrats. These are bourgeoisie, middle-class individuals. We have three classes, as I've explained many times before. The the bourgeoisie are always going to be in the middle. They're always going to concern themselves with the economics. Now, as I said, in the case of, of Ford, the American aristocrat, unlike the European aristocrat, has always been self-sustaining. That means he has to make his own fortune as well as perform his duties as an aristocrat, which is fighting and government. These are the uh, natural order to fight and to rule of the aristocrat. But besides this, as I said, the American aristocrat has to earn his living as well. And this is unfortunate, and this is one of the problems we're going to have to change. But you cannot point to any period after any group of people after 1900 and say, these were aristocrats because they don't exist in the 20th century. Uh, today, these we look back uh, pre-Civil War to the pre-Civil War period and see at this point where these not- great aristocrats, these fighting men existed who were cultured, who could wield both the sword and pen. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Texas uh, and the Texans. These uh, uh, well, but first I'm going to go into, uh, as I said, this period where, uh, at this point, where Texans could uh, be successful. Uh, it was a very open, air, uh, open range era where um, a man could work as hard as he wanted and get ahead. And uh, uh, you know, at one, at this was. Uh, why the fuck? Do, who the fuck do you think sends their kids to good schools? It doesn't matter. 
it doesn't matter what makes an aristocrat. What makes an aristocrat fundamentally? The ma- an aristocrat is made not in school. He's made by breeding and by uh, what he accomplishes. Accomplishment and breeding. He's not made by going to school. He's not made by joining the army. This is one of the fundamental things we learn in the case of Rip Ford and these individuals like him. You talk about how he was a lawyer and a doctor. He he taught himself law. He pra- he read law for four months and then he passed the bar. You can't do that today. That's illegal. You can't just go and read law and become familiar with it and take the test. You have to go through law school. They require it. Otherwise, you can't take the bar. And this is how today Rip Ford would not have been a lawyer. He would not have been a doctor. It's quite obvious. Uh, it, with it, within uh, Sam Houston was the same way. In four months of painstaking and and permanent study, a hard study, he passed the bar exam. And this is what they did in those days. And it's the same with medicine and several other fields. But basically, um, Ford was self-educated. He taught himself how to be a doctor. He taught himself how to be a lawyer. And he taught himself how to be a soldier. And in each of these professions, these vocations rather, not professions, these were vocations. Let's note the difference between vocations and professions. In each of these vocations, he was successful. His his uh, self-teaching was borne out by his accomplishments. Now, Texas, uh, uh, or rather Texans at the time, were known as some of the most fearsome fighters in the, in the West. And... Uh, this was prior to the Civil War in the 1840s, as I said, and they had the opportunity to practice warfare, fighting against both the Indians and the Mexicans. And uh, De Meester notes that uh, war is the natural order of things. <clears throat> and uh, Ford learned his trade as a soldier. This was his third great claim to fame. He, he was a doctor, a lawyer, and a soldier. He learned his uh, art of soldiering by reading and by practicing in these constant border wars that were occurring in the 1840s and 50s. And as I said, this is what made the Texans and Ford such great soldiers and known as such great soldiers at the time. There was this constant state of conflict, which uh, Meister notes is natural to man. Man is naturally to be constantly in a state of war, Low war. Now, as I said, it's perfectly natural and healthy to engage in warfare, for men to engage in warfare. Now, people will say, how can you be anti-war and uh, go along with this? Well, it's very simple, actually. Uh, what we, the, what our problem is, is to get the state out of w- the war business. We need to basically make warfare the exclusive domicile of the family. That's right. We need to get the state, the government, should not be incapable of waging war except in defense of itself. In other words, we return the government to the position of the monarchy in the Dark Ages, which basically uh, is a very weak situation for the government. And uh, how it was in Texas, for a long time, the family controlled the warfare. You had the Sutton-Taylor feud, which probably involved five or six large clans. And over the years, it killed about 40 men over 20 years. And everyone in the 19th century was horrified by these families' wars, these family feuds. All the popular writers of the day decried them. Uh, like Mark Twain and Zane Gray. They said, let the state run the wars. Let the state do all the fighting and abolish feuds and dueling and so forth. And so the state took over wars and warfare and spilled a lot of blood unnecessarily in the 20th century and just ruined the concept of warfare. When we think of warfare, we think of this horrid, bloodbath, whereas the family wars were generally low-key affairs. A lot of shots got fired, a lot of combat occurred, but very few people got killed. They did get killed. Blood was spilt. 
but it was nothing on the on the uh, amount of uh, blood that was shed in state wars. Uh, total war be- is a concept born of modernism. Total war is entirely a state uh, war. Basically, uh, in contrast, the border war in Texas went on uh, over a hundred years. It was going strong in the 1930s. They were shooting at e- Texans and Mexicans along the border were shooting at each other for sport. This was uh, basically a low-key conflict, and this is what DeMeister was talking about, raids, duels, small-scale pitched battles. This is the kind of fighting that the Indians practiced, and it was basically common across Europe and across the world until the advent of Jacobinism and then the advent of modernism, which uh, brought a uh, brought us to the conflict of total war, and uh, so this is about all I've got to to say about that. And but let's understand why the Texans were such great fighters, and why uh, and how Rip Ford learned his trade. Now he got the name Rip because he was the adjutant of a regiment uh, in the Mexican War, and he would write Rip on the envelopes uh, addressed to the widows of those uh, soldiers who died in combat. He would write, rest in peace, and they started calling him Old Rip, uh, as in, uh, rest in peace Ford. It was a nickname, and it caught on. He was basically known as Rip Ford. And uh, as I said, the Texans were the Kozaks for many years of uh, America, the America's version of the Kozaks, they were called Los Diablos Tejanos in the Mexican War, and I'm going to talk a little bit about these. It's a unique breed, you know, by the time Stanley Kubrick made uh, Full Metal Jacket, that's basically all was left that was left in Texas was steers and queers. You had nothing else, uh, but at one time they were a great people as they say, just like the Indians, you know, a great people at one time. Uh, and then they felt they went exactly the way of the Comanche. Uh, basically, there are hardly any Texans in Texas. I'd say maybe five, ten, fifteen thousand. And uh, anyway, moving on. These Los Diablos Tejanos. And I'm going to read an excerpt about them as they rode into Mexico. Uh, and they're un- they're unique people, as I said. Uh, and they were very successful in the Mexican War, uh, and uh, because they'd had so much experience, they were like the striking force of the American Army, and these were the guys who did the uh, fighting on horseback, and these were the guys who broke the back of the charging Mexican uh, forces on a number of occasions. And uh, I'm going to read a little bit about uh, uh, Rip Ford's regiment, for one, and among others. Uh, And by the way, I highly recommend uh, Rip Ford's uh, book. I think it was called, uh, uh, I can't remember what it was called. I think Rip Ford's Texas. That's what it's called, Rip Ford's Texas. But anyway, let's talk about his regiment. It got a reputation as a heroic, out-of-control tough, vengeful, trustworthy, fearless regiment. They had the most effective weapon in the war, the new Walker Colt six-shot revolver. The command had men in it who had suffered loss of relatives by the Mexicans, massacring prisoners of wars. There were men who had been Santa Fe prisoners, mere prisoners, and prisoners made at San Antonio by Vasquez and Wall. Young Lewin Rogers was in Mexico on a mission of revenge. Mexicans had cut the throats of his family. Mr. and Mrs. Rogers, their daughter and their son William, who lived as if by American. The affair had had happened on the Arroyo, Colorado, 30 miles north of Brownsville. Was it any wonder that it was sometimes difficult to restrain these men, whose feelings had been lacerated by domestic bereavements, and who were standing face to face with the people whose troops had committed these bloody deeds? 
They never made war upon any but armed men when the field was open and the lists were free. And uh, Ford was quite taken up uh, with uh, the war. He wrote a poem because he was a poet, among other things. And uh, I'm going to read a couple lines about this. Down, tramp the pennon to the dust. Strike, Texians, strike once more. Shall San Jacinto's glories rust? The god of battles is your trust. Strike as your sires of yore. And, uh, you know, this is what men did at this time. He was a poet. He was a, he was a warrior poet in the most original sense of the word. He was not a myth in any, uh, any sense of the word. Now I'm going to go ahead and read some more. Los Diablos Tejanos, cried the Mexicans as they crowded along the street to get a look at the Texas Devils. One war correspondent said they rode, some standing upright, some sideways, some facing the rear, some by the reverse flank, some on horses, others on mustangs and mules. But on they rode, pell-mell, wearing motley uniforms of almost every conceivable variety of pants and shirts, hats and caps. Caps made out made of the skins of the dog, the cat, the beer, the coon, the wild cat, and each t- cap had a tail hanging to it. And the frightened onlookers, not knowing whether to cheer or run, believed the Texan to be a s- sort of semi-civilized half man, half devil, with a slight admixture of lion and snapping turtle, and had a more holy terror of him than they had of the evil saint himself. This is the Texan at one time. Uh, what can you say about it? This, they were a remarkable breed. They were a unique breed. The region had shaped the type of men and women who who raised families in this region. They were more than a... They were, as I said, unique at the time. And this is where the, uh, the view of... Uh, Anglo-Saxon superiority came from that these uh, sub-ethnicities within the uniquely greater race who did all the bleeding, but the Anglo's in general took the credit for it. But the Texans were as much a unique race within them as the uh, certain varieties of Slav, uh, in my opinion. And once again, it's very interesting to note how they sh- they uh, came into existence, because Texas was a uh, very rough time, and as I said, uh, it was a time when a man could be successful. Now today, why don't men work commensurate hours as they did back then? Because subconsciously they realize that the fruits of their labors are not theirs. They cannot own property today, for example. For this reason, most Americans spend their money on luxury goods because they know it's futile to accumulate tangible working assets. And the reason it's futile, um, also people today even see the fruits of their labors. They, uh, they find themselves in- able, incapable of visualizing those fruits of their, of their labors because... Uh, in Texas, if a man worked hard, he saw his herds increase, he saw his cattle and horses and lands and tools, equipment increase. But today, when you work hard, you get more money in your 401k, and you know what the banks are doing with your savings. We have no such thing as a system based on genuine financial assets. All our system is based on is pure financial witchcraft, a fake credit system for slaves. And having realized that, uh, your average American slave continues to honor uh, honor it because slaves work for food and shelter. And your average American slave, the average person who's listening to this broadcast, essentially works for food and shelter. Now, since we live in a wealthy age... Uh, the slaves are also allowed a certain amount of toys. And this is clear of slaves in every uh, epoch are allowed a certain amount of toys. This is how the banjo was developed and uh, various other instruments. Uh, The banjo comes to mind notably, though. Uh, Once again, basically, we have 
the example uh, of the uh, of the free men at one time who did, were not laden with the subconscious burden of uh, knowing that they were enslaved. You had these free men in a free region in, or free regions like Texas or Alaska, and they were natural. And these regions, uh, these rugged regions, naturally select out the weak and servile. And when Ford came to Texas, as I said, he came and he stayed, and he fought in the Mexican War. He wasn't a bad man. He was a, an aristocratic type. His family went back to the Revolutionary War, and uh, they owned plantations in the South. He was one of the most feared fighters of his day, as I said. And I'm doing this, as I said, wholly to explain uh, the purpose of uh, and to... Um, bring out figures like uh, John Ford to help uh, people understand that they did exist. Now, as I said, uh, John Ford uh, was a lawyer. He practiced law for 10 years. Uh, and then he went to the state capitol about 1850 after the Mexican War and offered to raise a volunteer company of rangers. Uh, because he was very concerned about the Indian depredations on the frontier. Now, these were not general Indian depredations. These were Comanche in particular. The Comanche were the most feared tribe in Texas. And what would happen on a regular basis, because Texas had reservation Indians at the time, and what would happen is the Comanches would uh, go after basically, uh, basically, do some serious raiding, and then they would uh, mount up a, a militia unit to go after them, and the reservation Indians would join with the uh, white uh, militias to uh, go after these Indians. And quite often, uh, the, these uh, reservation Indians were more than happy to uh, assist the whites in massacring certain uh, groups of uh, what they would might call wild Indians, but, but like I say, the Comanches were a unique people with themselves within, uh, just like the Texans. They were all Indians, and the Texans were all white, but they are unique sub-ethnicities known for particular traits, particular abilities, and this is what was really extraordinary about delving into the subject of sub-ethnicities, because the greatest enemy of globalism today is the sub-ethnicity talk about wasps, we talk about these subsets within the Anglo-Saxon race, we talk about Mormons, they're almost a race unto themselves, as I pointed out. Mormons are the only surviving uh, descendants of the Yankees and the Puritans. But anyway, moving on, and as I say, we must preserve these sub-ethnicities. Uh, but anyway, uh, as I said, uh, Ford went and offered to raise this company of rangers to guard the frontier, uh, but they told him there was no money to finance it. So uh, he was also at this time running a newspaper, and uh, basically he decided to uh, push the idea of a ranger company uh, to guard the frontier, and uh, he uh, he pushed it quite vociferously in his paper. And uh, people thought his idea of this rangering force was nuts. He, they said he was crazy and uh, because of a head wound he had suffered in Mexico and during the Mexican campaign. So uh, essentially what happened was that uh, uh, it became necessary for the state of Texas to form this ranger company in response to the depreda depredations not of the Me the uh not of the Comanches but of a guy named Juan Cortina uh who is a Mexican bandit uh now today he's known as a Mexican civil rights hero uh when in fact he was an aristocrat and just liked to uh basically uh run uh you know, go after uh, uh, Russell Cattle, essentially. Now, the interesting thing about Chino is that you have no idea, no fundamental idea that he was a Mexican looking at him. 
it's very difficult uh very difficult to to tell that he's a Mexican. He does not look Mexican at all. If you Google Juan Cheno Cortina, he does not look Mexican at all. He has a full beard. He uh has a unique uh unique uh European look uh about him and this is was interesting because at the time uh the mexican the texans uh began uh moving into the northern uh or into the southwest you had a number of these european uh mexicans and what happened is that they disappeared because of miscegenation and uh, what caused this was uh basically the uh, whites miscegenating and uh, this is a great uh basically sin that uh, the whites committed against themselves and uh, because they say, you know, a white man, it's no big deal. It's uh, um, who he breeds with. It's just the women, the white women that matter. Well, this is not fundamentally true because once you corrupt a native aristocracy, you have no one to deal with. You have to deal with the native bourgeoisie that's the next lower class. And this is what happened many times with the Indians, with basically every other race the whites have come into contact, they have corrupted. They have corrupted uh, the aristocratic lines, the aristocratic breeding of the aristocratic families of these genes. They have taken their women, and what emerges from these unions is the breakup of the native aristocracy, as I said. You have another uh, guy who basically... Um, who basically uh, uh, was like this is Santos Benavides, who was... Uh, probably whiter looking than your average storm fronter or your average uh, he was certainly a blue blooded aristocrat and uh, uh, he was known as a Tejano at the time they were upper class Mexicans they uh, largely European featured and uh, they, as I said they died out now he is noted as Ford is for defeating Cortina in battle and uh as I said, Cortina was a sort of Pancho Villa in his time, and Pancho Villa, um, you can take a look at Pancho Villa's picture and see that uh, already the stock, the upper class stock is being watered down by the likes of Villa. But it, by, in the 1850s, you had people like Cortina, and uh, he raided into the U.S., he raided Brownsville, and uh, basically the he actually de was defeated. Uh, he actually defeated the uh, first four, the, um, the, the first um, white military, the Texan military force that was sent out against him. They were called the Brownsville Tigers. Now, uh, as a result of uh, Cortina's raiding, uh, which was quite extensive, uh, Ford was called into action. Now, Ford was, as I said was a Texas Ranger during the Mexican War. He was uh, largely known as an editor, a doctor, a lawyer, but he was also a very formidable uh, man in... Uh, very formidable formidable fellow in the saddle. And uh, like most uh, Texans at this time, he and his uh, small Ranger company of less than 50 men employed or like to employ the twin Colts, uh, uh, Colts Navy Colts pistols. And they're called Navy Colts pistols because they were intended for the Navy. But uh, the shipments uh, eventually became so popular that they were used in uh, other in other groups. Now, this uh, Navy Colt was sworn by, by the, this was the Texas Rangers' weapon of choice. Uh, Ford commented that uh, he'd been charged many times before by Mexican lancers, and uh, he, uh, he'd he never had the experience of actually closing on a Mexican lancer because uh, they always shot them out of the saddle from at least 50 yards away. And uh, this actually took as much skill to, you know, to lead a charge of pistols into a uh, basically force of Mexican lancers, a force of lancers. I'm going to take this call. Hey, you're on Stumble in Radio, for better or worse. Oh, it's a Libertine. Oh, you're just listening. Well, I could talk. I don't know. 
Okay, what do you got to say for yourself? <laughs> Not much. Uh, <laughs> what do you? How do you feel about this uh, this uh, concept of the cultured thug? I don't know. I haven't been listening to the show. I have no idea what you've been talking about. I just remembered that you had one tonight, so I. Hit the well, phone. I do appreciate that. I'm talking about John Salmon Ford, uh, the noted Texas Ranger, and his experiences uh, as a uh, prelude to discussing the formulation of the new 21st century man. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to go back into Ford here. As I said, uh, his uh, his Texas Rangers were almost constantly outnumbered by the forces that they faced. In this case, um, as I said, uh, Juan Cortina's force usually uh, numbered around 150 men, and basically this this was the type of warfare that was waged on the border. There was no large-scale fighting. and This was essentially you would see 50 men fighting. You, you, um, they all discharged their weapons. You'd say... You'd have one or two casualties, maybe four or five. It was not nearly as high as the Mexican War. Uh, basically, there's no way of knowing what sort of casualties were inflicted during the Mexican War because nobody kept track, neither the Mexican Army nor the American Army. But uh, post in during the uh, 1850s, during this what they're called the First, Second, and Third Cortina Wars, prior to the Civil War, uh, the Second Cortina War. Uh, basically happened when uh, Rip Ford uh, actually decided to start pursuing uh, Cortina into Mexico instead of just trying to hold the border. And this is another example of what uh, the futility of creating walls and barriers and so on. Basically, they said the Texas Rangers were there to defend the Texas border. Well, it was impossible for these small forces to defend the border. And this is why all this conservative talk about defending or guarding the border is nonsense, basically. It was not until uh, Ford began these incursions and decided to into Mexico to follow the raiders into Mexico and to dis decisively. So what I would say if I were handling the border issue is that I would just take a good percentage of northern Mexico and declare it, declare it a U.S. frontier. In other words, I would stretch the U.S. frontier about 10 miles. Of course, there are numerous uh, uh, applications to solving the border crisis, and the border crisis is largely over. The Reconquista is largely complete today, but as I said, there, are, there were numerous methods of dealing with that problem, and this was one of them. But anyway, Ford defeated... Uh, you remember... The, uh, Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. Do you remember a couple years ago? Uh, I guess it was more than longer ago than that. Um, they were talking about the electronic border. They didn't want to build a fence or a wall. They wanted to put sensors up everywhere. Now, well, the la the latest thing I've you heard is an you can't draw an analogy to to what you're talking about to to the modern day because if that an electronic border would work if it was backed up with a modern-day infantry division. Well, here's the thing. Uh, the point is, my point is, and the latest thing which Rand Paul, by the way, is advocating is having an underground electric fence on the border. And as the whole point is you conservatives are constantly erecting barriers. There's no point erecting barriers. It's a and I'm just using that as an example. There's no point in putting up a wall or a border fence. You can stop illegal immigration without going to all that trouble. It's much cheaper and more efficient to do it my way than to build walls or build virtual border fences that cost billions of dollars. Um, uh, it's far more effective to follow my solution. So anyway, uh, moving on here, uh, as I said, uh, this there was on multiple occasions uh this bandit was defeated in in every occasion uh he personally slipped away and d even during the civil war uh by the way he aligned himself with uh the uh, united states government he was offered a brig brigadier generalship 
um, by the Union Army, and they asked him to invade Texas at one point. Many people do not realize the extent of the duplicity that the federal government under Lincoln engaged in. They actually asked oh, yeah. this Mexican bandit to invade Texas. Now, as I said, he invaded in 1861, late 1861, and he was defeated by uh, Santos Benavides at the Battle of Carrizo. Now, Benavides was a fa fascinating figure, as I said. I'm not going to go into him tonight, but he was another of these aristocrats. He was a uh, 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 Tex... Uh, what do they call him? Well, he was essentially a me uh, upper class Mexican, though. He, he had complete European features at the time. He w became a brigadier general in the Confederate Army, and he was one of the final uh, officers in the Confederate Army to surrender. And uh, he defeated uh, Cortinas with ease, and as, re as a result, he did not get his uh, brigadier generalship within the human Union Army because his power was effectively broken during the struggle. And uh, but anyway, moving on, Cortin uh rather uh, Ford and uh Benavides were the leading Confederate uh military officers in Texas during the Civil War, and they were very successful at it because they'd had basically 20 years of fighting between them since the Mexican War. There there were these constant uh, skirmishes and fights, these running battles that occurred uh, with the Comanches, with the Mexicans, and they called each one of them a war, basically. The, you had these little um, fights involving uh, less than 500 men on both sides, but they were called wars because everybody got to, there were charges and various uh, campaigns involved, and on very low level, but uh, as I said, uh, once again, uh, this involvement produced uh, a certain breed of men, and of which Ford is notably uh, uh, a great example of this. Now, Ford's uh, book, Rip Ford's Texas, is a very interesting study. It's actually still in print, believe it or not. I could not uh, access the full copy of it, but I highly recommend it from what I've read of it. Uh, it's called Rip Ford's Texas, and uh, he, and it's on the cover, it says this is uh, from a man who participated in virtually every major event in the history of Texas from 1836 to 1896. He served as a doctor, a lawyer, a surveyor, a newspaper man an elected politician, and above all, a soldier. And as I said, this is what creates, uh, this is, uh, of course, he was also uh, an author as well, and a historian. He spent his latter days doing this. This is the example of the American aristocrat. This is what the superior American uh, man was at one time. He no longer exists, but he, but this historical figure who has been completely forgotten I read about him in my uh, youth, and then I saw this uh, guy uh, on this radio show, this old man show, I think it's called, uh, on Stormfront Radio, actually, who had done a broadcast on uh, Ford, and I thought it might be interesting, to It's a radio called the Old Man Broadcast. And, of course, my broadcast on him is far more interesting than his was, but, as I say... Uh, because I, I want to use him as this role model of the sword and pen because Mandalore actually thinks he doesn't, uh, these types of people do not exist. They're a myth. The idea of the cultured warrior poet is a myth because they are erased from the pages of history. They do not fundamentally exist. Uh, I'm up late. What are you talking about? I may talk a little longer because uh, of I'm on an interesting subject, and I'm going to, as I said, do a series of broadcasts called the Sword and Pen Broadcasts uh, to highlight these forgotten figures who are involved, uh, who are involved in both art and action. And uh, anyway, I'm going into Rip Ford, uh, continuing with Rip Ford. He was one of the last American, uh, uh, last Confederate generals to surrender 
uh, in the Civil War. He fought the last battle of the Civil War. That's how extraordinary um, his uh, campaign was. In May, almost two months after Robert E. Lee had surrendered, he fought the last battle and he won it. And uh, he completely defeated and scattered the Union Army uh, facing him. And uh, it was only days later that he learned that the, the war was over and he had to surrender and sue for peace. Uh, in my opinion, and the, in the opinion of a lot of individuals at the time, Texas might have stayed, uh, might have survived the collapse of the Confederacy. A lot of people believe that. And this is what the expression, gone to Texas, received new meaning after the Civil War, because a lot of these ex-Confederates thought they'd go to Texas, but it didn't work out, so they just kept going. They went to Mexico. Now, this is what Ford did. He actually sold his sword to... Uh, independent Mexican Republic that was trying to secede from the Mexican government uh, prior to the Civil War. This was after Juarez threw uh, Maximilian out of the country, and this independent republic tried to form in northern Mexico. And uh, Ford joined them and served as a general in this little country's army. And this is one of the uh, great unknown stories of the war. And basically, prior to this, uh, Ford had uh, been involved in a plot to take over Cuba just before the Civil War. So he was constantly intriguing in, in, uh, in one manner or another. He was also very interested in politics. He was a member of the Know Nothing Party very early on prior to the Civil War. And uh, many people don't know why it's called the Know Nothing Party. They think it was because it was made up of men who were proud of being simple. In fact, it was called the main Know Nothing Party because, first of all, it was not an official political party. It had no political uh, platform or movement or uh, central committee or structure like that. It was a political movement very similar to the Sheep Party movement. Only this movement was run by... Freemasons and aristocrats, so it was more successful. And it was very secretive and clandestine. People would ask, uh, do you know about this new group? And because it was a group, it was not a party, it was not a political party, and people would say, and the people who were affiliated with it would say, I know nothing. And basically, uh, the Know Nothings were very successful at first. They elected a lot of local representatives, a lot of mayors, and a lot of uh, they took over a number of cities, and they were basically on a, on a Native American platform. They said, we'll only run Native American candidates, people who have their roots in this country, no immigrants, no Germans, no Irishmen, and so forth, no Poles, and so forth, uh, only Native Americans. And many people don't realize this is when the WASP supremacy died, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant supremacy died with the Know Nothings and the Native American Party. And basically, Gangs of New York very briefly touches on this, but uh, it's, it's very, it's in brief, very brief. And uh, in fact, uh, what we have here, as I said, is the Wasp spirit dying in the 1950s. I mean, in the 1850s, rather. Yeah, over a century later, it's, the Wasp still existed and they still were in power, but uh, the Wasp spirit had died in the 1850s. And I personally believe that if Sam Houston had run as a know-nothing for president in the 1850s, as he was asked to do, the Civil War might have been averted. However, he probably would have been assassinated uh, running as such. So I'm not really, uh, you know, who knows how it would have turned out, but... It's very interesting to conjecture what have, what would have happened to the Know Nothing movement had Sam Houston run for president in 1854, uh, I believe it was, or 1855. I'm not sure. Ask Harry uh, Turtle Dove. Yeah, well, Turtle Dove would never consider such a possibility. Turtle Dove would be naturally anti Know Nothing. Uh, True. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, be, being a Jew. But anyway. Uh, moving on, uh, no, uh, Ford became a know-nothing, and uh, he ran for office as a know-nothing. He was elected 
as a state representative. After the war, he participated in the overthrow of the carpetbagger regime and was once again le elected to power. And this, the way, for a number of years, Ford was basically the de facto, uh, or could have been rather the de facto ruler of Texas. And I say that, this sounds rather crazy, but I say that because of his role in the overthrow of the carpetbagger government. Basically, he walked into the middle. There were two sides. They're the native Texans. They're the carpetbaggers. They both have armed men. The carpetbaggers have these black militias. Then there are the uh, the white native Texan militias. And Ford just walked into the middle of it and started issuing orders. And basically, his presence was the deciding role in the overthrow of the government because basically Davis lost by a two to one vote. Davis was the Republican. He lost to the native Texan whose name escapes me at the moment by a two to one uh, majority. But he refused to relinquish his office and he had these troops within the Capitol. So basically this was Ford's defining moment. He was a hero. He was the best known military man in Texas. Even after the Civil War he was widely respected, and as a result, he uh, went into uh, went into the Capitol, rode into the Capitol with his gun strapped on, and began issuing orders. And essentially, he prevented all violence or any violence from occurring until this uh, 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 Governor Davis was removed from power uh, legally at this time and at this time he was his credit was enormously high he became a state senator he was later elected mayor of his uh of his hometown of uh Austin where he uh, lived i believe it was Austin and uh he uh, edited a newspaper but basically he never recovered his fortunes after the war this is another thing about uh, the american aristocrat they do not value money above all else, as we might say. <coughs> Excuse me. Their service to the state, their fighting ability, this is, uh, he begins the, uh, the, the beginning of his book. The first chapter is entitled, My Fighting Stock. My Fighting Stock. The Fords came to the New World at a rather early date, he re he records. But um, basically, he's not bragging about his origins, but his blood is fighting blood. He comes from this long line. He can trace his ancestry far back. This is the essential uh, rule of aristocracy. Blood always tells. And it doesn't matter where this blood comes from, or if they have titles, or if they're well-known, blood tells. And this is the fundamental rule of aristocracy. And this is why you don't see aristocracy in this day and age, because it completely lacks uh, that um, ability, or rather that uh, beginning of this blood uh, tr trait. But anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, Rip Ford died quite impoverished. Uh, he was quite an old man. He was quite respected. He was a politician. He was married three times, and he had about uh, four or five children. But uh, and he always had enough to live on. But he never uh, he never had any land, and he never uh, was able to never was in business. And as a result, uh, he. Uh, spent his last years in quite impoverished circumstances, but uh, usually uh, it was a it, um, as in such cases in that era, as I said, a far more noble era than what, the one we currently live in. The society recognized his contributions and, quite independent of the state, provided enough money for him to live on because he didn't have a pension, despite. His years and his um, his years of service to Texas, and he never asked for a pension either. In fact, the particular <coughs> uh, variety of aristocrat which um, emerges here, we see Rip Ford requesting pensions for his uh, men, the men who served under him. He has one chapter in his book called "Rich Man's w uh, War, Poor Man's Fight," and this is because during his time when he was virtually military dictator of Texas. 
he stipulated that the rich men, the landowners, go to war. Um, he, in other words, he basically drafted all these wealthier men, and he let the poor men stay home to take care of their farms and their families and so forth. For example, he would send plantation owners off to war and let their overseers run the plantations for them. And this was the sort of uh, man he was. He he basically would ask for others, but he never asked for himself. And as a result, uh, as I say, um, basically they had enough uh, enough uh, consideration for him. There were enough other noble people at that era that they kept him supplied in his old age and they basically uh were able to uh raise money to keep him uh, to meet his needs and the needs of his family and uh as i said uh once again ford uh, died in uh, around 1896 he was quite an old man he never changed his views on slavery or women for that matter as uh as one of his acts in his later, in his uh, last years, uh, brings out, I'm going to repeat this act before closing, he was became a member of the Texas uh, Historical Society at one time. And uh, basically, the, uh, tried, they uh, said uh, they were going to recognize men and women equally. And... Uh, in this historical society and basically Ford would not stand for it and uh, he uh, basically stumped out of the uh, of this assembly the Texas Historical Society and uh, as I said uh, uh, he said there better be a distinction between the members and the lady members in in the constitution of the society, the bylaws of the society. He said it was a, another victory for the campaign to secure female equality, and he would not stand for it. And as I say, he stalked out, and that was the end of that. But anyway, uh, in his last days, he was interviewed by Frederick Remington. He said uh, Remington found uh, uh, him to be a very old man with a wealth of no white hair and beard, bent but not withered, he writes. He said, uh, I suppose you have been charged many times by Mexican lancers. And he said, yes, many times. What did you do, he asked. And Ford said, I reckon to be able to hit a man every time with a six-shooter at 125 yards. Now, I have a little bit difficulty, a difficulty believing this, but I'm willing to give him 100 yards on it. So... Remington said, then you do not think much of a lance as a weapon. And Ford Wright said at the time, no, there is but one weapon. The six-shooter, when properly handled, is the only weapon, mind you, sir, I say properly. And uh, this was very much the view of the Texas Rangers a long time in. Uh, at one point uh, in the 1920s, we have a documented case of a Texas Ranger going against five uh, Mexican gangsters, uh, or actually they were smugglers, uh, bootleggers, with armed with Thompson machine guns with his two uh, black powder Colt revolvers. And uh, basically all five of them ended up dead. And we, we have these cases that we think uh, they never happened. It seems mythical. It seems Hollywood style that a guy goes into a room with five... Uh, guys armed with machine guns with two old-fashioned Colt's revolvers and uh, basically kills all five of these guys. And But this actually happened. This is an There's a reason doctor. for that. Why? If you'd ever been in the military, just from the training, you would know that automatic, that having the ability to fire an automatic weapon makes you lazy. Well, like as I say, the marksmanship goes. Yeah. Uh, that is entirely well, he, possible. He's good. That guy was good with the pistol and was doing the right thing, and these guys were spraying bullets. Yeah. 
But that's essentially it. it and uh, basically, you could say it's not that big a deal to shoot five Mexicans armed with machine guns <laughs> from a certain perspective. But, uh, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. You're correct in saying that, though, uh, that it's very difficult, you know, to get a, to learn to use an automatic weapon properly, just spray bullets. Uh, but my fundamental thesis in this broadcast and in the future sword and pen broadcast is to present these individuals like Captain Thord, who are models of refinement, models of gentility, and they were also stone-cold killers. And this is what the future holds. This view of people like Kodranu, who actually shot several policemen, shot and killed several policemen in the court in his younger days, in cold blood, just out, out just completely. Of course, they were guilty. They had tortured uh, several students at the time. That's a, that's a matter to be discussed on another show. But Kodranu very coolly went in there and gunned them down, and uh, then stood trial for it and was acquitted for it. But and uh, these cases are to illustrate the purpose uh, that we do of the new 21st century man. This new what Bowden calls the cultured thug, this new person who is neither afraid to use, who is perfectly educated, an art of an artistic mind, uh, well dressed and well spoken, and yet is completely able of, to use violence in the extreme, and completely disassociated from the American middle class and the American male as he exists today. So this is my fundamental thesis, and we will be pursuing the Ku Klux Klan broadcasts as uh, time goes on, and we will be also be doing the Sword and Pen broadcasts. I have an uh, interview upcoming with a, uh, I think it'll be next Wednesday, with a uh, uh, proprietor of uh, a blog here. I think it's called the Omega Virgin Blog. It's basically run by a virgin, uh, similar to Weekel. Uh, who can't get laid? Omega Virgin Revolt. Dot WordPress. Dot com. That's what it's called, and we're going to discuss his problems and uh, the problems for the American be male. Fun. <laughs> I didn't hear. I said that should be fun. <laughs> yes, I'm not going to be. Well, you know what comes, what happens is I honestly feel sorry for some of these guests, and I just take it easy on them. I. I had some heavy artillery to unload on one of our guests, and he seemed like such a personable chap that I decided not to. So it depends on how this young man acts. I, I haven't listened to the last couple of shows. I, I, I intend to listen to the Julian Lee show because I, I'm actually interested in that one. Um, yeah, well, that was actually quite good. Uh, uh, if I do say I didn't really talk much, so I will say... It was quite a good show, and if you're interested in Julian Lee's perspective on music and culture and celibacy, it was quite good. I, I do believe that the American male should become celibate on a great scale, well, you know. I, obviously, I'm not into that, but uh, Julian Lee is just, he is one of the most fascinating people I have ever encountered online. Why do you feel that way? I don't know, it's kind of just a gut, I just, I read his stuff, and I like it. He's, um, I mean, he and I could not be farther apart, but he's, he, it's, his stuff is just really interesting. Well, that's very interesting. I've always thought a lot of him. He has a artistic temperament that a lot of people uh, call him, uh, call him, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's a, it's a kind of uh, gayish personality in some regards. He's not. He's not gay. I'm saying. He's not a I'm saying he's no, not that's not what I'm saying. People. What I'm saying him. is, what I'm saying is that his artistic mentality, personality, is often mistaken to be somewhat effeminate. But uh, in fact, uh, it's just yeah. it's just that artistic personality coming out. Do, he's do, a very. Do, uh, do the, that's very correct. To the extent that that's the way we've all been trained to perceive that for a long yeah, time. I, yeah, we brought that out in the show. 
And as I say, he's a very talented fellow, and he's just going to have a – he has a different emotional status than a lot of people who are less talented than he is. And I accept that perfectly well, but I'm just saying some people – uh, have their perceptions altered, as you said, which is very perspicacious. And uh, uh, but uh, I have the highest respect for Mr. Lee and his work. And uh, I hope to have him on the show again. And when I get a real show, I'm hoping to have him on that. Hello. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's dead air there. <laughs> Okay, well, I just thought you had something else to respond to that, but uh okay, I was uh, busy doing something here. Sorry. Okay. Well, yeah, as I said, uh I hope to have him on again. He's a, a great uh, good white man as we say on Stumble In. And Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. In his own weird way, yes. Well, I don't consider it weird. I consider it quite normal that will become the new norm once we've put women back in burkas, you know, and uh you know, just restored that element. You just love to my fucking buttons, don't you? <laughs> you do. No, not going to well, respond. <laughs> well, I do appreciate you calling in, uh, Libertine. It was just to listen. And I'm um, going to close down the shop now. So uh, uh, do listen in to the Omega Virgin broadcast because it should be interesting. And okay. uh, this is. This is Breckenridge uh, Elkins uh, signing off Stumbling Radio. You all have a good night.